Wavelength. The real issue with data privacy is who's collecting your data behind the scenes, so in the back end of it, and who is that being shared with? Sparking the combos about Adelaide. It's every woman's choice. If they choose to have an abortion, then so be it. You should be having... These issues need to be properly investigated and we need to make sure that LGBTIQ people are supported to be who they are. On Fresh 92.7... Welcome to Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having. I'm your host, David, and joining me tonight is Adrian. How are you doing, my love? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. It's such a good day today. Um, How are you enjoying spring so far? Mate, (laughs) you heard me earlier. I could not stop sneezing. I love the flowers. I love the atmosphere. I love the sunshine. I love the temperature. When we we do get sunshine, because we have also got quite a bit of rain, haven't we? I know, it's such a shame. I don't like it. You don't know what to wear in the morning. You get out of the house and you're like, what am I wearing today? Am I wearing shorts? Am I wearing a coat? Am I wearing a raincoat? <laughs> it's so frustrating. I hate the it. worst thing about it is the pollen. And now I am terrible hay fever. So Yeah, I cannot um, say that I know what that is because I've never had hay fever, so <gasps> I don't know what that is. I'm jealous. How I know that I know that now probably hundreds of people are hating me right now, but I've never experienced hay fever. Yeah, I'm one of them. <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> Tonight on Wavelength, we are demystifying naturopathy, a practice that has held many Australians, but it's also not really considered science. Chances are, you've seen a naturopath in the past to solve an unexplained illness, or you've had a friend refer you to one. But I wanted to ask, is the practice legit? We'll also be letting you know everything you need to know about the coronavirus this week. But next, Andrew will be letting you know why Facebook is considering banning news from its platform here in Australia. You're listening to Fresh. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having. Adrian, a few weeks ago you might have seen some headlines suggesting that Facebook is considering banning Australian news from being published on the platform. Pretty wild, don't you agree? Well, um, I actually did not hear about this, but that does sound pretty wild. I mean, that's uh, nowadays most people get their news from Facebook, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> Where are they going to get their news from? <laughs> exactly. Well, the suggestion is actually part of a little bit of a scuffle between the Australian government and tech giants Google and Facebook. Andrew's put together a package explaining the war of words. Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. Have you opened Google recently and seen a massive warning that the way you use it could be under threat? Or did you notice Facebook threatening to stop Aussies sharing news? Well, it seems the Competition and Consumer Commission's plan to allow news organisations to charge them for sharing content is causing quite a stir. This is what the ACCC had to say about it. The code simply aims to bring fairness and transparency to Facebook and Google's relationships with Australian news media businesses. So to get the lawyer down, I had a chat to Rob Nichols, an Associate Professor in Business Law at the University University of New South Wales, and we began by discussing what exactly is going on. In 2019, the ACCC came up with a report called the Digital Platforms Inquiry. That made a large number of recommendations to government as to the competitive effects of Google and Facebook and other platforms in Australia. One of the recommendations was relating to the interaction between Google and Facebook on one side and the news media businesses on the other. Essentially, the ACCC found that there was a bargaining imbalance and recommended to the Treasurer that there should be a voluntary code which would allow news media businesses to deal with each of Google and Facebook in order for them to be paid for some of the news content that's used by the platform. In December 2019, the government responded to the ACCC and announced that it would support there being a voluntary news media bargaining code, but also asked the ACCC to report back by the end of June 2020 as to the progress on getting that code together. Well, in fact, what happened was that in April, the ACCC reported back to the Treasurer and said there's no chance that Google and Facebook are going to agree to a voluntary code. The negotiations have just collapsed. And as a result of that, the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, directed the ACCC to draft a mandatory code which would address the imbalance between the two. The ACCC did this. They published it at the end of July. There was a consultation period for the whole of August. And during that consultation period, Google started putting up yellow triangles warning Australian consumers that their interactions with Google, both in search, 
understanding YouTube were under threat. The ACCC responded to that by calling it misinformation. And immediately after the submissions on the draft code closed, Facebook announced that if the draft code went through in its current state, then it would stop allowing links to news on its platform. So that means both Facebook and Instagram. I didn't mention WhatsApp. The purpose behind that was Facebook wanting to see changes to the code before it's introduced into Parliament, and that's expected in the budget session in October. Do you think Facebook and Google are sort of justified in feeling threatened by this new media bargaining code? I mean, for example, you were saying about Google issuing warnings when users access their platforms, for example. They're threatened for two different reasons in Australia and one much more important reason internationally. So the two reasons in Australia are the draft code as published assumes that there's a symbiotic relationship between Facebook and news media businesses or Google and news media businesses. But it assumes that the content creators add more value than the content curators. And so the code assumes that there would be a money flow from Google or from Facebook to the news media business. That means Google and Facebook are up for paying some money. So that was one issue. The second issue is that the draft code also requires Google and Facebook to give 28 days notice when it will change its algorithm such that the news content would appear somewhere different. That's a much bigger issue for Google. It's an issue for Facebook, but it requires each of them to change their business processes. And what's more, because that change would have to be done in Australia, reflecting the whole of the world, in effect, it's changing their global business practice. The third issue is the big one, the international one. And that is that the similar provisions, but under copyright law, happening in Europe currently. So there's a European Commission copyright directive that would require Google and Facebook to pay copyright fees to news media businesses in the European Union. Now, the big issue for Google and Facebook in Australia is that if that Australia could act as a, a benchmark, firstly, by determining that fees should be paid, and secondly, Although the code allows for confidentiality, secondly, potentially setting the benchmark for that. What is the net value of the interaction between Google and news media businesses or between Instagram and uh, News Corporation? So those potential benchmarks could lead to much bigger exposures for each of Facebook and Google in the European Union. In a recent article for The Conversation, you sort of talked about how Facebook could actually be worse off overall if it does follow on through on its threat to ban news sharing um, for Australian users. Why exactly is that? Well, Facebook, in its submission to the ACCC and some of the other publicity, pointed out that in the first five months of 2020, there were 2.3 billion clicks from Facebook to Australian news media businesses. So Australian Facebook users and Instagram users post a lot of news from news media businesses. The way that the draft code works is that you can't replace Australian news with international news because that would be discriminating against Australian news media businesses. So there'll be just no news. No news from the ABC, but no news from the BBC. No news from Channel 7 and no news from Al Jazeera. So the effect would be that the only news like things would be fake news. So as much Al-Anon as you want, as much Chan 4 or Chan 8 as you want, but the really horrible and distorted news, which isn't a news media business because it's not real news. The effect of that will be that I think many people start to say, well, this isn't the Facebook that I let my 13-year-old sign up to. This isn't the Instagram that I'll use to promote my business when there's all this horrible stuff around as well. So the threat to Facebook is quite real, but Facebook has made its ultimatum in the knowledge that this is genuinely the nuclear option. It will turn out badly for Facebook, and Facebook believes it will also be bad for news media businesses. 
And the reason the ultimatum is so stark is to try and change the view that the Australian Parliament has of the draft code. Slight question without notice, Rob, but as I understand it, there's actually a sort of Facebook news service overseas. Is that right? Absolutely. And what Facebook said in its negotiations with the ACCC is, here, look, we've got a Facebook news service that operates in the US and provides a payment stream to news media businesses. The problem with stopping at that point is that if they'd gone ahead and said, we will launch this in June 2020 in Australia, and therefore there will be no need for a mandatory code, I'm sure that the ACCC would have taken that on as being a sign of good faith. Similarly, Google could uh, announce its deals with New Matilda and Crikey after the Treasurer had directed a mandatory code. If Google had actually made these offers earlier on in good faith, then the ACCC would have taken a different view. Basically, what you've got is, if there are options, there are options that each of Facebook and Google have, they could have offered them earlier in the first part of 2020 in Australia and resolve this issue. All they did was say, but we do this in the US rather than making the good faith offer, we'll do it in Australia as well. So some of the impact of the mandatory code comes from Facebook and Google talking about products that they have but not offering them in Australia. How are the uh, news organisations and digital platforms sort of deciding how much their news content is worth? Are any organisations being left out of that process? Yes, there are. So essentially you've had big ambit claims from the news media businesses in Australia, starting with Peter Costello, the chair of Nine Fairfax, saying it's 600 million, and then up from there to about a billion by News Corp. On the Facebook and Google side, Facebook's estimate is that it, in that first five months of this year, it generated $220 million for news media businesses. So that would what take it up to about half a billion a year. So what we've got is these ambit claims, but I think they're both quite interesting because what they get to is that the effect of this symbiotic relationship is that the net value flow is actually quite small. Maybe measured in tens of millions of dollars, might be measured in millions of dollars. And I would not be at all surprised to see the final version of the media code being very clear that a zero dollar outcome is not an inappropriate one from the negotiation process or the negotiate arbitrate process. Now, by government policy and for reasons that sort of make a little bit of sense for the ABC and make very little sense for SBS, the national broadcasters are excluded from getting revenue from either Google or Facebook. The Greens have come out against that and said, well, they sh- should have revenue flowing from it because they have a significant portion of their revenue flowing from advertising in any case. But in the main, ABC and SBS have been more concerned with one of the other features of the code, and that is the ability to moderate comments. So one of the things from the code is that if a particular uh, link is used, that the news media business which is linked should be able to moderate the comments. That is to say that a link to a particular story did not imply either something in favour of that story or against it. So a promotion of a particular person did not imply a promotion of their political beliefs, for example. So do you think any of this will have a sort of tangible major effect on ordinary users at all? I do. I think that the risk to users is if Facebook goes through with its ultimatum, although I think that risk is relatively low because whatever the amendments that are made to the draft code before it's introduced, to Parliament, then Facebook will have the opportunity to say, OK, well, some changes were made. Google has become much more conciliatory in the closure of the submissions. I actually think for most Google users, it would be difficult to tell that there may be a change. I think there might be a little bit of a change in the that flows from this non-discrimination provision that I mentioned. So it might well be that Google is a little bit more thoughtful, well, not 
Google, its algorithms are a little bit more thoughtful in making sure that there is a balance of news between news which is paid for and news where there is no fee to be paid in Google search. I don't think it'll make any difference to YouTube. So there is a potential for a difference, but not very much. The actual amounts of money that are involved are really, really small in the scheme of things for Facebook and Google, and actually not terribly big in the scheme of things for the Australian news media businesses. So I don't think there's going to be any cost reflection in the outcome. I think that potentially you might be a little bit more certainty if you do a search or you want to get access to news on Instagram, that it'll actually always appear in the same place that you expect it to and not suddenly change to some other place. And this flows from the obligation to give notice of algorithmic changes. So what's next? Well, I wrapped up by asking Rob what we can expect over the next few months. I think it's a watch this space but uh, you won't have to wait for long because the government will go through and introduce a version of this code in October. The Greens want to see a, a variation where ABC and SBS are paid, but that's the only major issue that the Greens has to setting it up. Centre Alliance in the Senate is likely to be in favour because ultimately all this flowed from a, a deal Nick Xenophon did in 2018. So I think we'll start to see more certainty on this in the next few months. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. That was Andrew chatting with Rob Nichols from the University of New South Wales about the little battle between the ACCC and tech giants Facebook and Google. So just to quickly recap, basically the ACCC's submitted this draft code, which would make uh, tech giants like Facebook and Google pay in news organisations in Australia to host content. So it's after like a long period of time where so many news publications have had to lay off people because they're not making money anymore. They don't make money off Facebook. They don't make money off Facebook, no. And um, the thing is, if they do go through with it, if Facebook goes through with something like this, they ban all Australian news. So, like, no Sydney Morning Herald, no, even no Fresh 927 news, no The Advertiser, no, none no of that. No, nothing. All we would be left with is just, inverted commas, fake news, you know? Just, like, people that have blogs that can say whatever they want, totally unsubstantiated, not professional journalists. Exactly. And then how are... Because, like, it's very hard for people to change their ways. They're not going to... Well, maybe they do, but it's it's going to take a while before they start looking for news in respectable sites because mm-hmm. where people get their news first from is Facebook yeah. and social media. So it's going to take a while until these people realize that the news that they're getting from all these uncredited sources are fake, are mm. BS. Like, mm, yeah, yeah. How, do we, how do we know? How, how do we, we would all have to become our own little journalist to know exactly. what we're doing and especially, what we're reading. Especially because Facebook, I'd say, in the past, has not actually been very good at showing people oh, that well. things are fake news. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's, like, clearly things on the website that aren't true and people fall for it all the time. There's that huge, like, QAnon group, anti-vaxxer type people that just have huge presences on the website yeah. and they just get away with it, you know? Mm-hmm, they do. And it's, it's ridiculous. And so I, I guess for this could be, like, if we have to take something positive of this, maybe people will learn how to be more... Um, how to? They will learn how to question and to think outside of the box and be like, hmm, maybe this is not hundred percent true. Mm-hmm. Maybe this will teach people to go and look for the sources and look for uh, alternative news that say the same article but in a different perspective to totally. to build up their own opinion about stuff. I mean, like Rob Nichols said, the Facebook and Google's approach to like basically be like, no, is mm-hmm. the nuclear option. It doesn't <laughs> look like it's going to happen, thankfully. thankfully. But if it does, I mean, there's something to be worried about. You can hear an extended version of Andrew's chat with Rob in our Wavelength podcast, which will be going up shortly after the show finishes. But coming up, we'll be getting into our main story of the night, done by you this week, Adrian, about yeah. naturopathy. Looking forward to that one. You're listening to Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength with David and Adrian this evening, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having. So, Adrian, you've put together tonight's lead story. Tell me a bit about it. 
Absolutely. So I think it's fair to say that we've all heard about naturopathy mm-hmm. at some point. Uh, and in many cases, it wasn't good press, probably. However, lots of people swear by naturopathy. In fact, it is becoming more and more popular each day. So I wanted to know what all this controversy is about. Totally. We've got the first part of your story here for you guys right now here on Wait Wait on Fresh 92.7. Naturopathy has become in the last few years a wildly spread medical practice that has the world of medicine divided. Some people love it and some people hate it. But we're interested in why it's caused so much controversy. So I talked to Bianca Markovic, a last year naturopathy student at uni who sees patients regularly. She started by explaining what is naturopathy exactly. So it's basically the study of nature as cure for diseases so it's it's not an old um so it's not a it's not a modern concept even though it kind of feels like it is because we're so used to you know growing up and we've gone and seen doctors but it's basically the basis of western medicine where we kind of look at diet a little bit more you know when a disease comes up it's not as you know we're just trying to treat it symptomatically like oh that leg is inflamed let's treat it with an anti-inflammatory it's kind of looking in a more holistic perspective and you're looking at okay well what foods is that person eating that might react to that what emotion is, is this person going through right now what is their environment like are they having toxins from their environment that's slowly um, poisoning them we're seeing a lot of mold toxicity come up and um, yeah we're learning about kind of these things and pulling them into a scientific base but essentially um, the tropathy is treating the person as holistically as possible um, and imploring employing things like making sure hydration is there and and doing things that don't include herbs even or um, pharmaceuticals unless it's totally necessary which which at at points it is but if we can adjust you know the simple things like getting enough sunlight getting enough love in one's heart getting enough water and enough adequate nutrition which is often where a lot of disease stems from yeah then then you can really adjust the person's health and and then they might not have to rely on as many medications it sounds like you're describing some some sort of like promoting a lifestyle in which you keep healthy habits in order to be a healthier person and therefore avoid the need of using medication. Yeah, absolutely. And focusing on more prevention rather than cure as well, just like adjusting small things in someone's daily life. And we all we all engage in activities um, that we know are unhealthy, but it's a matter of balancing it out and knowing where you can, you know, you don't have to sacrifice all those things to be able to live a healthy lifestyle. You just got to put enough of the good stuff in. And that's when the tropathy is really really awesome especially in chronic conditions where it's built up over a long time you can you can really put um a lot of goodness into that person's life where they're not having to sacrifice a whole lot of their lifestyle just tweaking a few things and and yeah seeing um seeing some results whereas i guess you know doctors are super pressed upon they've only got 15 minutes in a consult and they couldn't possibly go over like some you know some of the nutritional things or um some of the simpler things that we might be missing because we yeah we look at disease in a different way is it black or white when it comes to either follow and seek naturopathy treatment or modern medicine treatment or can you complement each other? All the time. Like, there's, there's is it compliments for sure. Like, there is a reason why, um, you know, there's complementary and alternative medicines. That's a, a whole area, like, we call it calm medicines and, and it encompasses different um, healing modalities. And, you know, modern world, like, science is a wonderful thing. There's a lot of science that's backing up all the herbs that we're using. In fact, every pharmaceutical... I can't vouch everyone, but most of the pharmaceuticals were derived off of herbal derivatives from the beginning. So there's no doubt that herbs work, but we've got some really great innovations in science and medicine at the moment. And I think working together is incredible. Like, you know, take for example, um, my dog got a paralysis stick the other day and I had no herbal remedies, you know, and, and it was a pretty, pretty serious thing up there on the East Coast. I, I took him to the vet to get the anti serum because I believed in him. Like, I knew that that was going to be my best chance of helping him. And then after researching like an absolute demon and some friends getting in touch I found out about this herb called bracken fern root and it's wildly indicated for reversing paralysis um, from a chick in animals and so I had him on that as well and he's 16 years old he's come back and he's looking healthier than ever and I think using both of those things together would have it really increased his chance of survival whether you know if I just used one or the other um, I think it could be a really complementary thing 
in in both places. And it's unfortunate that there's a view on, on you know, it's us versus them when really, like, we can all hold hands and, you know, media plays a huge part in this. And um, prior, well, I guess, you know, my degree, I'm, I'm studying a four-year bachelor degree, Bachelor of Health Science, because we would do the same thing. And so I've got a good understanding of anatomy. We're, we're learning all the time. We learn about different pathologies. It's, it's not a bullshit thing. You know, there, there are totally some smaller courses out there that are, you know, maybe only one year or, like, six weeks and people are coming out of those and, you know, referring to themselves as a, a very highly qualified naturopath. And that's incorrect. I think that goes... Yeah, it's, it doesn't... It shouldn't be what people kind of attach all of that. To. And we're, we're trained in our degree and quite, quite harshly assessed on it. If someone's presenting with red flags, and you don't take action to say, this is out of my scope of practice, I'm going to actually suggest you get an ambulance or I'm going to refer you on. You know, I'm not going to charge you for this consult because I think, I think something deep is going on here and you might be in actual danger and you might need acute medical care, which is where the Western medical system is incredible. Here in Australia, we hear about naturopathy and everything, but I do believe that it's much bigger in the US. How exactly, how big it is exactly in Australia? Look, it's definitely a growing field and I think I've seen that I've, I've been doing my degree, I've started part-time and now, now full-time, so I've, I've been there for a bit and I've seen the numbers grow. You know, heard, heard people speak about we're having more associations step up in Australia, but I think, yeah, this is a great point across the world. Like, if, if I was to study naturopathy in America, it'd be six years and I'd be a doctor afterwards. So they take it pretty seriously over there and um, arguably some of the um, original fathers or you know, connoisseurs of um, naturopathy kind of came out of and the ones that were writing the literature anyway were coming out of there. So it's it's way more widely accepted as a modality. From what I'm experiencing in my own circles as well, more and more people that I wouldn't have expected to care to or ask any questions about their health are asking for my opinion. And, um, and I believe that's because, yes, a lot more people are looking towards um, natural alternatives. And, you know, it only takes a pandemic to kind of <laughs> get everybody out and, yeah. and go, you know, what can I do in my backyard or what can I, what can I do to protect? Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. That there was Adrian chatting with Bianca about natural medicine and naturopathy. I want to sort of start by saying I feel like I had no idea what naturopathy was and now I feel like I know a lot more and totally changed my conception of what it was. I mean, when I first met her, because she is a friend of mine, she used to live here in Adelaide, and when I first met her and she told me all about naturopathy, I was like, wow, that kind of sounds right like it's not as uh, it sounds legit so how legit is it actually but she has gone through training like yeah. she's a trained professional at uni a bachelor's degree for four years she studies anatomy and she wanted to make sure that we understood that all the bad press that that uh, naturopaths get is for uh, specific cases of negligence right. it, but that happens in uh, traditional medicine as well yeah like you go to the doctor and sometimes uh, it happens that you get a case of negligence with a doctor. So it's it, it, in both cases, but we don't see, we seem to put the magnifying glass on naturopaths. I think they have a bit of a strange reputation. People think they're a bit quacky, a bit a bit too yeah. whimsical, a bit witchy. You well, know? But at, at, at times it's something like she was telling me something that I could not include on the card. But she was telling me about solving things that are not like super super important in inverted commas mm. like she was talking about a miracle berry for patients who have lost taste buds for treatments like chemo and things like that okay. which magnifies and invigorates your taste buds and makes bitter go sweet so if you mix wow. that with your food it changes your life and your mental health completely because it's something as tiny as I can taste food again mm -hmm. which obviously a doctor it says oh well it's one of the side effects yes it is what it is but if you can fix little things in life even when this with this, it, it would change completely your patient, I think. Yeah, like you said, you couldn't include it in the cut. You can hear a very extended version of that chat with Bianca in the podcast, uh, so make sure you jump on that after this show. Uh, we've got more of your story about naturopathy later on, Adrian, but after the break we'll be letting you know what the hell is going on with politics this week. You're listening to Fresh. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength. We'll be getting back into Adrian's story about naturopathy soon, but for now, let's throw to Hamish to let us know what the hell is going on with politics this week. What the hell is going on in politics at the moment? Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. 
This week saw former PM Kevin Rudd take aim at media mogul Rupert Murdoch and his News Corp monopoly, launching a public petition into a royal commission. It currently has over 300,000 signatures, although there is no obligation for the government to address the issue, no matter how many people sign. Instead, Rudd is hoping to spark a national conversation over the Murdoch media empire's influence in modern Australian politics. Meanwhile, a group of Chinese Australians say their loyalties were questioned when they were repeatedly asked by a Liberal senator to condemn the Chinese Communist Party during a committee hearing. A leading expert has warned that such behaviour could alienate Chinese Australians from the political sphere as the tensions between the two countries continue to worsen. Also in the news, a new report has detailed the devastation the pandemic has had on the live arts sector, with two out of three jobs lost this year and a forecasted $23 billion deficit. The industry has flagged concerns that the JobKeeper initiative must be extended far past the currently scheduled March deadline if the harsh restrictions handicapping the sector continue. Finally, the coalition is planning to make cashless welfare cards a permanent policy and the ASI announced in its annual report that politicians in local councils are most at risk of foreign influence. And that's what the hell's been going on in politics this week. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. Thank you for that, Hamish. Stay tuned for part two of my story where I chat with Dr Lane, our favourite doctor here at Wavelength. Right now, though, you're listening to Fresh 92.7. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength. Before the break, we heard part one of Adrian's story about naturopathy, where he spoke with Bianca, focusing on natural treatments. But what I really wanted to know was the opinion of a Western medicine professional, so I got on the phone with Dr. Lane to get to the bottom of it and see if modern medicine is the one true way when it comes to seeking treatment. Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. As a medical professional, when did you first hear about naturopathy and what did you think of it? Oh, look, I think I've always known of naturopathy and I knew about it before I studied medicine. Obviously, during my medical degree, we learned a lot about other therapies, what we call sort of uh, alternative medicine and complementary medicine. And of course, naturopathy would sit within that sort of field. So that's probably where I became a bit more aware of it in my professional life. To, to take a step back, so we need to understand what the difference is between traditional medicine and alternative medicine. So in the sort of medicine that I would practice, we work in a field which we call evidence-based medicine. In other words, the medical science that we rely on is typically congruent with the universal science method of gathering evidence. In other words, to call something science, you said we really actually need to fit a certain pattern of interpretation and testing to actually be scientifically proven. Alternative medicine, and I know a lot of people swear by it, but has gained its definition because it doesn't have any biological, I guess, basis to its effects. Now, that doesn't mean that some people don't report that they get great effects from it, and it also doesn't mean that in Western medicine we always use proven techniques. As the years have passed, obviously it has become more popular, especially here in Australia and America. Has your opinion changed at all with the years and, like, research papers about it? Look, I'm a big believer. If somebody feels better with a therapy, that's a great thing. Mm. And even in Western medicine, there's a lot of times where we... We don't have answers for things or we try therapies which we tell the patient we're not exactly sure how this works or if it's a full placebo effect, but if you get an effect from it, that's great. And that said, just to make an example, in evidence-based or traditional medicine, we do still draw on natural therapies a lot of the time. I mean, you look at, we we use supplements in early pregnancy for folic acid, which is a a type of vitamin, and even iodine, which is a mineral. So we encourage people, you know, to take vitamin D and calcium, you know, later in life. Um, We often talk about healthy diets and healthy eating because we do know that there are really good effects of that. When I was talking to this uh, naturopath, they talked a lot about healthy lifestyle, diet and hydration. And those are things that seem very common recommendations in both naturopathy and modern medicine. Absolutely. I mean, look, healthy, healthy lifestyle, I think, is the fundamental basis to 
a good health. I mean, but that said, you know, it's it's hard to sort of say that a healthy lifestyle will protect everyone. I mean, I've seen some really amazing things in my time as a doctor, but I've also seen some very tragic uh, things. And I think to to sort of be able to distinguish from the fact that, yes, a healthy lifestyle is a great thing to have, but it's not always going to be the key to fixing everything. So I think it's really important to distinguish between the fact that, yes, we definitely encourage healthy lifestyle. And I talk about that a lot with patients in preventative health. I think preventative medicine is much better than curative medicine. But that said, there are times when we do need to draw on evidence-based medicine to treat illness or disease. Have you encountered any naturopathy patients or even have you even worked with a naturopathy doctor? Absolutely. So we have um, doctors in medicine who practice something called um, integrative medicine, which is essentially a very similar thing. So these are doctors who go through medical school, but at the end of medical school, rather than necessarily specialising in one of the sort of conventional disciplines, they might go into what we call integrative medicine. And look, we have patients who certainly swear by their doctors in integrative medicine. But again, I always encourage people to keep an open mind. One of the biggest concerns I've had with some of my patients who have uh, participated in integrative medicine is one, the cost. The other thing is that sometimes, um, and I'm not saying that this is only happening in alternative medicine, but certainly sometimes integrative approaches have actually been what I would say quite harmful. And we've actually had a few situations with patients who've experienced some quite significant and irreversible side effects of therapy that was unscientifically based. I mean, that kind of goes into the question about the bad press that naturopathy as a whole has been getting over the years. Would you say that those cases that you were just talking about are isolated cases of negligence? Certainly not having a go at naturopaths. I'm not having a go at the field of naturopathy because that would be unfair for me to do so. I think what I would say is if I'm suggesting a treatment or a medication, there's always a risk that that could do harm to somebody if we are intervening in their lifestyle. I will just say one last thing, though. Yeah. I don't want to make it sound like I'm against all, you know, complementary therapies. I mean, one particular example is a very commonly we, we have a lot of our practitioners who do things like hypnotherapy or even acupuncture. Now, acupuncture is one sort of alternate therapy where there isn't necessarily a lot of evidence behind how it works. Certainly, we don't have the same knowledge of how acupuncture helps people as we do with some medications. And yet, we know anecdotally and from studies that a lot of people report really good effects from it. And it seems to be one that probably has a very low risk of, of harms. There can be a sort of a bit of balance between it, but I think the question we need to be asking is, as a health practitioner, we need to be very objective. We need to give people facts. We should be upfront about whether there is good evidence behind what we're recommending or not. And it really needs to then be the individual's choice as to whether they go through that process or not. One word that I think it's key here, you have said balance. The next question would be, is it black or white when it comes to seeking treatment? Is it either one or the other? Or can it can, can naturopathy and modern medicine be complementary? I personally think it does not have to be one or the other at all. I think that everybody's health journey is unique. I have a lot of patients who have you know, see both traditional and alternative medicine practitioners and I think that's absolutely wonderful if that works for them. So, no, I don't think there needs to be any animosity and I certainly don't want this to be a, a case of me coming across like I'm saying that our approach is better than another approach. I think my clear message would be understand the facts, make sure you're asking the right questions. So I have been doing some research and I talked about it with the naturopath the other day and we were talking about naturopathy treatments like one you've mentioned before acupuncture that are getting really good results in patients as a, uh, as a treatment to treat side effects from chemotherapy have you heard anything about these treatments or these articles part of the it raises it a good point i think you know medicine is such a expanding and vast field there's so much out there and there's so much that's being released on a daily basis one of the important things to recognize is that when you go and see your gp or a single doctor we work in huge collaboration with people behind the scenes who are doing a lot of work to appraise data and look at it in a really non-biased and objective way. So if, if it's about if it's about reducing and making increasing comfort levels of people, then that's wonderful. And if people have found that that's really helped, I mean, uh, who am I to say that that's not a worthwhile intervention? I think, um, you know, it's very interesting um, discussion and I think it's something that we need to keep a really open mind to. I think that different people working in different areas of health need to work collaboratively and whether that means that we are all working in different areas or, or the same areas, um, I think we do need to be open to discussion and I think that's a really positive thing. Wavelength.
sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. That right there was Adrian chatting with Dr Lane. It's so good to have him back on Wavelength. It's been a while, hasn't it? It has. I've missed him. Oh, we all miss him. He's such a great guy. I mean, really interesting chat that you just had. What I really took away from it, though, was that traditional Western medicine, stuff that Dr. Lane practices and naturopathy can be complementary. Yeah. And you should not be seeking either one or the other. You should not be tame team naturopathy or team Western medicine. Because at some points there is definitely places where they overlap and mm-hmm. it can be helpful to seek both treatments or even to pale down pains and side effects from uh, traditional treatments, you can rely on naturopathy. Absolutely. Another thing he said that really st- struck me was that not everyone's health journey is the same. Everyone's yeah. health journey is unique. I mean, for me, exa- for example, um, generally mostly just see doctors, but I've had back pain for a large part of my life. And I used to see for a long time a Bowen therapist, which is not traditional at all in terms yeah. of like seeing a physio for yeah. that kind of thing, but it really helped me. What they do is they just like massage your um, pressure points all through mm. your whole body. It's the most relaxing yeah. but most painful thing I can ever tell you. It's so good though. But uh, if at the end of the day if wo- it works, exactly. who, like who cares if it's scientifically based or mm. not? Like it works on you. You do see results from right. it and it's testimonial from you, David. It works on me. So yeah. what's what's wrong with that? I, I mean, There's nothing wrong there's with nothing that. There's nothing wrong with that. Unless... There's negligence involved. Exactly. So I think you have to, I mean, you're not going to go see a naturopath if you break your arm. No. You so, yeah. naturopath, naturopaths have also, they also need to be uh, aware of what their capabilities are and, mm-hmm. if, and refer, like Bianca was saying, refer to, you, to a doctor if, if they feel it's out of their reach, out of what they can treat. If you break your arm, you're not going to go to a naturopath, you're going to go to the, uh, to the emergency department. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and if you need um, if you if you need insulin because you're a di- uh, diabetic, you're not going to have lavender tea. You're just yeah. going to go have insulin. So yeah. it's finding the balance, the gray zone between both. You can do both. I really like the idea of naturopathy, though, being like about holistic wellness and yeah. about about looking after your body and making sure you're well hydrated, eating properly, and then you have sunlight. Yeah, and then like happy. mental health is also like it really plays on your physical being. Absolutely. So I mean, if it's all about keeping you happy, healthy, hydrated, and and good diet and healthy lifestyle. Why not? Welcome. (laughs) Yeah. That was a great story. Thank you so much for putting that together, Adrian. Uh, Anyway, next Wavelength explains everything you need to know about what's happened this week with the coronavirus. But right now you're listening to Fresh. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having. Right now we're getting into our weekly segment where Wavelength explains what has happened with the coronavirus this week. Wavelength. On Fresh 92.7. A lot has been happening this week in regards to coronavirus restrictions easing up. And great news for the people of Victoria. It's so crazy to think that while Adelaide has been out of lockdown for months now, Melbourne has still been under lockdown for more than 100 days. A live press conference held by Daniel Andrews yesterday has just announced huge progress for Victoria. The Premier has announced Victoria's coronavirus restrictions will ease up on outdoor gatherings, sport, travel, hairdressers and auctions. Melbourne's five kilometre radius rule has now been extended to 25 kilometres, which means the people of the city have more freedom to get out and about and start normalising their daily lives once again. Starting from today, groups of up to 10 people from two households will be allowed to gather outdoors and the two-hour time limit put in place for socialising and exercise will be scrapped. Outdoor sporting activities will reopen, such as outdoor swimming pools, tennis courts, skate parks and golf courses. It's also huge news for many allied health services as they can now resume face-to-face services, an absolutely crucial operation for mental health support. The Victorian Premier has also announced that from November 2, retail stores and beauty services will be allowed to reopen. And for the first time in months, hospital businesses will be allowed to seat patrons with a maximum of 20 people inside and 50 outside. In New South Wales, one new local case of COVID has been detected. Another infection connected to the Great Beginnings Child Care Centre in Sydney's southwest after four new cases were linked over the weekend. In SA, an interesting new survey has shown that South Australians are confident coronavirus has been banished from the state, although officials haven't shared the same confidence with the Victorian border. SA Health has announced three more infectious expatriates, bringing SA's coronavirus tally to 482. 
Earlier this week, ScoMo announced that eight special recreation flights from India, Britain and South Africa will bring home more than 1,300 vulnerable Australians. These Australians will be given top priority to buy Qantas flights home after getting tested negative 48 hours before the flight. Upon return, they will have to quarantine in Darwin at the Howard Springs facility for 14 days before returning home. And authorities have been desperately trying to track down 17 Kiwis that entered Victoria after flying into New South Wales earlier this week. A blame game over the burst travel bubble has started heating up as Premier Daniel Andrews hit out the border force to enforce delays on a domestic flight from Sydney to Melbourne. I'm Jamie, and that's what's been happening with old mate Rona this week. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. That there was Jamie letting you know everything you need to know about the coronavirus. You're listening to Fresh 92.7. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having with David and Adrian tonight. Right now, we're going to go into our weekly segment when we transmit the happiest news in the world via the radio. Amazing technology. (laughs) This week, Andrew has put together the segment for us. Heaps good news on Wavelength. How's your week been? Still worried about the coronavirus? Your favourite Netflix series been cancelled? Or are you just suffering some typical Monday-itis? Well, we're here to brighten things up a bit during these pretty dark times. Firstly this week, we're headed overseas to the United States, where a Texas 14-year-old has won herself a major $25,000 for helping to work on a potential COVID-19 treatment. Annika Shebrelou says she developed a molecule that can bind to a certain protein on the virus, which will stop that protein functioning. She reportedly used computer programs to make her findings, with the teen saying she was inspired by her chemistry professor grandfather. Meanwhile, scientists in South Africa have invented a new, more eco-friendly shark barrier which could help protect humans and sharks from each other. The system uses magnets, which they're apparently very sensitive to, in recyclable plastic pipes to keep the sharks away. It's much better than nets, which are notorious for harming animals, although it could be quite a while before they're widely implemented. Let's just all hope that, soon enough, we won't need to say this every time we go out on the water. You're going to need a bigger boat. Heading back to Australia now, our friends in Canberra went to the polls on Saturday, ultimately re-electing their Labor government that's been in power for 19 straight years. But that's not the biggest story here. Residents in the city's Gungahlin region were able to order their democracy sausages and have it delivered by drone. God knows I'll be ordering my snags next election if it can be flown to me. What a time to be alive. And you may not have heard of Farina, but the rural town in SA's far north has just been handed over 50 grand to install substantial green technology, including solar systems and battery storage. The town has been gradually restored by volunteers over the last 12 years, although still mostly runs on a brief tourist season, with hopes the new tech will help reduce the cost of generating their power. And there you have it, just a handful of the good stuff going on around the world this week. And tune in again next week, where we're aimed to put a smile on your face with more heaps good news. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. Thank you for that, Andrew. Anyway, that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you, Adelaide, for listening. And thank you, Adrian, for joining me oh, this evening. Oh, thank you. And make sure to be subscribed to the Wavelength podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can listen back to our old episodes right now, and you'll be the first one to know when tonight's episode goes up. Wavelength.